Good morning and welcome to the Cincinnati USA Regional Chambers Member Benefits Special Session. I'm Jill Meyer, President and CEO. Thank you for joining us this morning. The aim of today's session is helping you and your business navigate the COVID-19 crisis by looking at return to work planning, supporting your workforce's physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Following our speaker, we'll have a question and answer session led by Beth McNeil, the Chamber's Senior Director of Membership Sales and Engagement. You have joined this briefing in listen-only mode with your microphones muted. Please type any questions in the chat section where Beth will be able to see them and make sure they are asked. And if you've joined us by phone or you need to sign off sooner, you can view the full webinar which will be posted at cincinnatichamber.com within a couple of days. Today's webinar is spotlighting the Cincinnati Regional Chamber's phenomenal partner, Humana. The Chamber is proud to partner with Humana to provide competitive medical, dental, vision, life, and wellness products to our member companies through Chamber Health. Humana strives to be the leading health and well being company focused on making it easy for people to achieve their best health through a, co through a coordinated care approach. Humana is committed to improving the health of the communities it serves and includes Cincinnati as a part of its bold goal communities. Since the, 20, since the 2015 unveiling of its bold goal, Humana has focused on addressing the impact that social determinants and needs such as food insecurity, isolation, housing, and loneliness has on the people within those communities. We are honored to work closely with the Humana team to bring health and wellness to our chamber members, and we're thrilled that we get a front seat as Humana's innovation comes to fruition for the Cincinnati region's future. A special thank you goes to Humana's Tom McMahon and Shannon Hero for your local leadership and partnership. One quick note, if you are interested in receiving more information about Humana services today and saving up to 20% on healthcare, please type your contact information along with your company name in the chat going to the facilitators. And now let me introduce you to our featured speaker, Dr. William Schrank, Humana's Chief Medical and Corporate Affairs Officer. Dr. Schrank's responsibilities include implementing Humana's integrated care delivery strategy with an emphasis on advancing Humana's clinical capabilities and its core objective of improving health outcomes. In that role, Dr. Schrank is also on point with state and federal governments to meaningfully impact public health policy. Dr. Schrank joined Humana from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where he served as Chief Medical Officer of the Insurance Services Division. And before that, he was the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer for CVS Health. Dr. Schrank began his career as a practicing physician in Boston. He has served as an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, as well as a director at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. He has published nearly 250 papers. Dr. Schrank received his BA from Brown University and his MD from Cornell University Medical College. He completed his residency in internal medicine at Georgetown University and his fellowship in health policy research at UCLA, where he also earned a Master of Science degree in health services. I think we can agree before he even says a word that with Dr. Schrank's background, as well as the work he is leading for Humana, we are in for an impactful discussion this morning. So let's jump in. Physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Welcome, Dr. Will Schrank. The mic is yours. Well, thank you so much, Jill. Uh, and I really appreciate it. It was such a generous and kind uh, introduction. Oh, it's telling me I need to join the audio. Can, can you hear me? You can? Great. Um, 
So thank you again for that really kind introduction. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this chance to have a discussion with you, uh, share with you some of what we're seeing at Humana, uh, some of our interpretation of what's going on in the landscape at this really, you know, quite uncertain and often unsettling time. Uh, and to try to, you know, give you some tools and some thoughts about strategies uh, as we try to get the economy back and we try to get folks back back um, to our, whatever that new normal is going to look like and return to work, uh, what's the right plan? What's the right process? How can we, um, as employers and in the healthcare sector, uh, work together to try to facilitate a return to work strategy that uh, works best for, um, for your businesses, for your employees, for us in general. So my hope is um, not to talk for too long, but try to talk a bit and then, you know, answer some questions and have a, have a discussion with you all. But begin with a, little, a bit of a discussion around, around stress and mental health and some of the challenges that we're all, we're all um, faced with. Some more specific discussion around return to work strategies and largely report out what we're seeing um, uh, as recommendations from CDC and from other federal agencies around around the, the best and safest strategies, most appropriate strategies for return to work. And then uh, then I'll talk. I'll spend a little more time on testing, uh, an area that is um, is really complicated. There's a number of different tests that are available and a number, a number of different reasons why you would test. Uh, and I hope we can kind of break that down a bit and simplify the process for you uh, so that um, we you know, all can make better decisions around who needs testing and what's, uh, and, and what's the appropriate test to choose. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. And you know, just sort of to level set, this is a time of considerable uncertainty and stress. Um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of sources that are just entirely out of our control. We know that um, folks, uh, our employees, are are stressed uh, as a result of economic challenges, concerns about the safety and appropriate access to the healthcare system. Um, increasingly, we're seeing more and more stress around even access to basic needs, healthy food, stable housing, um, in addition to health insurance. Um, and um, The process of getting back to work is a source of stress for a lot of Americans too. Uh, it's, it's sort of the, this this idea of the right amount of exposure and what what's reasonable risk. And this is all in the setting of considerable, you know, sort of fragmentation and rifts uh, related to racism and related to um, uh, broader social issues across the country that are all sort of in the background. These are underlying sources of stress for uh, all of our employees. If you go to the next slide. And we all know the symptoms of stress. Frankly, I think probably many of us have experienced them all in the last day or two. Um, uh, whether it's irritation, uncertainty, nervousness, difficulty sleeping, feeling sad or depressed. Um, you know, I think we're all also struggling with issues, certainly outside of work, related to our children or our our elderly, frail parents, and and how um, you know there's a lot of moving parts that suddenly we're all forced to um, to try to contemplate and try to come up with solutions for. But in addition, you know, the work-related stress is meaningful as well. Um, how in this new environment where many people are working from home, uh, these concerns about either coming back to work and getting and, and risk of getting exposed versus staying at home and sort of separating out um, family and, and personal and, and work-related needs 
Um, it's all, this is, this is a very different work space, work, um, uh, work environment. And I think all of us are trying to figure out uh, the, the best sort of personal strategies, personal approaches that can, that allow us to be successful in our work uh, and in our, and in our lives at home and our personal lives under these new circumstances. Next slide, please. So uh, the CDC has done a nice job of sort of uh, pulling together um, some recommendations. And we can share these slides later. There's at the bottom, I, I don't think you can see it here, but there's a, there's a, a, a link to uh, CDC recommendations. But I would just, just uh, I mean, man, this is essentially all self-explanatory. You do not need a, uh, you, you don't need to be an epidemiologist at the CDC to understand this, but uh, it is, I think, useful just to be intentional and take a step back and just recognize that at a time where our employees are dealing with a lot of stress, that that stress certainly impacts their productivity and unquestionably can impact their health. So there's a handful of strategies that we can employ around just better communicating with our, um, our coworkers, our employees, uh, be really clear about the things that we don't have control over, but those that we do be, be very clear about how we, how we assume control, clarifying what our daily routines are and what our expectations are of each other. Um, to be, you know, well informed about where the risks are with respect to COVID-19 and how to protect ourselves, how to be, you know, very intentional about exercise, taking breaks, maintaining healthy lifestyles, and also at a time where a lot of people are feeling socially isolated, making sure that we're all connecting with others is really critical. Um, I mean, this is all relatively self-explanatory, but uh, just urge folks to really be intentional here because I think there is an opportunity uh, if we do to um, help our coworkers, help our employees, and, and ideally create a healthier and more productive environment for folks to, uh, to, uh, to work together. Thanks, next slide. And um, with respect to returning to work, there are um, a handful of decision points that um, have been sort of established and we've sort of come around to best practices and the CDC has, uh, the CDC has published a lot of documents on this, but I simplified to really the three that I think every employer should see and should, should take a good look at and be familiar with um, that try to help us to figure out how to make decisions about the appropriate cadence or appropriate tempo to return to work, how to keep the workplace safe, uh, and then uh, thinking more about the support of the of employees. Next slide, please. So this, I think, is a really important decision tool that the CDC has produced that would be great for folks to be familiar with. First, um, uh, the first key decision is about sort of getting people back to work, and and it's important first of all to be really aware of what the local, state, um, and government um, orders are, but then it's, you know, increasingly we're realizing that a lot of work can be done at home and at a time where there is going to be more risk at, at uh, when folks return to the office, make sure that we think about that and that we have policies in place for higher risk uh, employees to make sure that we can keep them safe. Those are, those are, that's a first pass to make decisions about whether or not uh, to reopen the office. Once you've made that decision, then there's a variety of specific um, uh, actions the, to maintain the health and safety of your employees that you need to consider and put into place. First is around promoting uh, healthy hygiene practices, hand washing, making uh, uh, sort of hand sanitizer, that kind of stuff available on, on the floors of the office. Make sure that you have really thoughtful um, and far more uh, proficient cleaning, disinfection, ventilation processes in place. Think hard about how to encourage more social distancing of the office and if there are ways to reorganize or re, um, reposition desks and workspaces to optimize social distancing. Uh, it's a very different kind of decision-making process than we've all had in the past where we're focused on and, you know, uh, uh, sponsoring and promoting engagement. 
now the goal here is really try to figure out how to optimize distance while still um, uh, promoting um, uh, you know communication within the office. Everyone's trying to figure out their their travel uh, practices within the and commuting practices within the office. I can tell you we are not planning to start restart any any work related travel. Uh, through the summer and having a sort of a specific policy or approach that you can clearly communicate to employees is important. And then just making sure that everyone is well educated and aware of these tra of these these protocols is, is key so that there's a level set around expectations. And then around ongoing monitoring. Uh, I think one of the hardest things I know that when I was a medical resident or a practicing physician uh we always took pride in the fact that we showed up for work every day regardless of how we felt and if we were sick we still figured out how to get to the office and i remember there are lots of times where i would come home and say you know say things to my wife like i think you know half of the people that i took care of today were not as were not as sick as i felt today that is a cultural change that we have to change that's a culture that's a culture that we have to change we must 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 reset culture around the recognition that if someone's sick they stay home and we have to take pride in that we have to take pride in creating good strong uh, 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 contingency plans for if someone is sick how do we make sure that there there's a, a thoughtful coverage process so that ultimately we are keeping uh, sick people away from the workplace to help keep the remainder of the workforce safe uh, I'll say I also think this is we're we're sort of getting to a a place where increasingly it's going to be table stakes to have be checking people's temperature when they get to work uh, or asking them to check their temperature and a test prior to coming to work. This is a this is a new time where there's going to be you know I think very clear expectations that we need to make around what our employees um, check and how they attest to that. Uh, every day and take some accountability and personal responsibility. Once those safeguards are in place, I think we're in a much better position uh, to open up the workplace. Um, next, next slide, please. So these are, uh, I think I spoke to most of these topics in terms of uh, pr reducing transmission amongst employees. Um, uh, just to double click here, um, I, I think you know the more the, the the more we over communicate to our employees about the efforts we're taking and the expectations we have for employees about their own uh, accountability around what the expectations are on daily uh, health checks um, and the culture of making decisions about uh, appropriate choices of staying staying at home when we're sick is absolutely, absolutely critical. And the more, the more we over communicate, the better position will be to, um, to uh, uh, the better position will be to be able to, you know, keep a safe workplace and keep the doors open and be more productive. Next slide. So now to the testing. This is the hard part. And uh, I'll just open by saying that this is a rapidly evolving space so what um, if i were to have given this presentation three weeks or a month ago it would have looked incredibly different we have the tests are the chat the tests are evolving and getting better and our understanding of what we do and don't know about the effectiveness the characteristics of the tests the usefulness of the tests is all changing as more and more evidence becomes available so this is this is not the final word. This is a point in time, uh, but it's really critical that if we're going to use tests, and tests are going to be an important part of our ability to both identify uh, disease, make sure that we're keeping others safe. Testing is an important part of the public health strategy, an important part of the employer strategy, an important part of any individual's medical safety. Um, understanding the appropriate choices about what tests to use when and when to use them is really really important and from a return to work uh, perspective there's a lot of i think misunderstanding in the in the in the marketplace today 
and I hope that th this discussion can uh, kind of help to simplify and solidify what we know today, where this is all going, and ultimately um, help make you know help make help simplify this process of making making these decisions. So there are two key categories of tests. Within those two key two key categories there are many different brands and manufacturers, but the two key categories that test different things. One is the molecular or antigen test that tells you if the person currently is shedding virus. If there's vi if there is if there is virus. Um, uh, if there's COVID-19 virus in that patient, essentially, it detects the genetic, genetic material from the virus itself. The other kind of test that many are talking about is a, is a antibody test. It doesn't measure whether or not the, you are, whether you're shedding the virus or have the virus. It measures your own reaction. It measures the patient's reaction to the virus. Have they created, have the, has the body created antibodies to protect that person from the virus. That's a measure not of the virus itself, but the antibodies to the virus. The, the collection process for these two types of tests are entirely different. Um, the molecular uh, or antigen tests are largely through mucosal service surfaces. So the most common now is a nasal or a throat swab. There's some other mucosal services surfaces that we're exploring to see if there's simpler ways of testing, but currently it's, it's nasal or throat swabs. Um, antibody test comes from the blood. It's serology. It's, it, requires, uh, it requires a blood draw. The tests tell you something entirely different. The molecular test tells you if you're shedding virus, essentially if you're currently and actively infected. An antibody test tells you if you have been infected, you, you either could be currently infected, but it takes some time after the infection for the, um, the antibodies uh, to show up. So it can be on the order of four to seven days before the antibodies start to show up. But they also continue to persist. We don't know yet quite, quite yet how long, but they persist after the infection has um, has, uh, uh, has resolved. So they tell you they're less useful in telling you if you're actively infected because of the delay. You can be symptomatic for days before you have a meaningful antibody response. They're more useful for telling you if you've been infected in the past. So why do we get these two tests? What are they useful for? The molecular test, the test that tells you if you're infected now is essential to be able to diagnose the, the, the illness, diagnose the infection, to isolate those patients who are infected. They don't infect others. Um, it begins a process that allows you to make better decisions about how to treat that patient. Is, a, a, is, is there a therapeutic? Increasingly, we know that there's remdesivir. Uh, there's, there are these um, high-dose steroids that can be useful in the treatment of patients uh, with COVID. But it's also really useful to isolate the patient so the patient does not infect others, and then to do what's called contact tracing, to go and identify all the patient, all the people that person had meaningful exposures to since uh, their likely infection, to try to reduce their exposure to others and reduce the frequency or the likelihood that that infection spreads. The antibody test is for something different. It's trying to understand someone's. It's whether they have been infected in the past and are immune and how that, uh, what, what that means in terms of their risk of being reinfected. It's more of a risk management tool. It's a tool to say, if somebody has been infected, they're at much lower risk to go back to work or to enter public spaces. Um, they're, um, they don't, you can conserve pers PPE, personal protective equipment. You don't have to do subsequent testing. Um, if you believe that the antibody test confers meaningful protection. And that's something we'll discuss in far more detail in a moment. There are challenges in interpret interpreting the antibody test today that limit our ability to draw those conclusions. But that's the rationale. That's the rationale for why we do the antibody testing. So the limitation, there are meaningful limitations of both. Uh, in for somebody who's, who gets a molecular test, just tells you if they're infected or not. 
It does not tell you anything about their risk, their subsequent risk. It's a point in time and it tells you what to do now, what to do now for that patient and what to do, whether or not they um, need to be isolated and what to do in terms of risk mitigation if that person is infected. Uh, in terms of the antibody test, there are a lot of limitations today. There's a lot we don't know about uh, whether or not the antibody test, what level of protection antibodies confer. And we'll talk, there's I have a whole slide on this. We'll talk more about this in a couple of minutes, but we don't know yet the extent to which antibodies confer protection, how long it lasts, or what it really means in terms of um, how we make decisions for our employees, for our patients uh, who have positive antibody tests. So it's an important limitation and it's a, a key factor in how we're thinking about what to do with antibody tests today. So where can you get a test? This is really opening up now. Um, for molecular tests, uh, retail pharmacies, you can go to any Walmart, Walgreens, CVS and get a, get a, a molecular test. We're seeing more and more drive-throughs, you know, hospitals and primary care clinics increasingly are offering the testing. And maybe, you know, to me, most importantly, there's increasingly more availability of home testing. And that, I think, um, will be uh, a real sort of sea change. The more we can get testing done in the comfort and the safety of our own home, that does not require us to go out and get exposed to others or expose others if we are, if, you know, if, if, if patients are infected, uh, that, that that home testing is a really important contribution to the, how I think the, the, the sort of the continuum of care is going to look in, in months to come. I think increasingly we're going to see more and more of those self-administered home tests. And it's important to recognize that self-administered home tests don't require quite as um, aggressive a nasal swab. You don't, you know, I think we've all seen on TV that patients who get the, um, the nasal swabs, it's, it's uncomfortable and it requires a really um, sort of, it, you have to get up high into the nasal turb turbinates in order to get a, a satisfactory um, swab. The home testing is, is a little less invasive and easier to self-administer. Uh, antibody tests now are, uh, are omnipresent at, at commercial labs. So, um, and commercial labs, the large commercial labs, LabCorp and, and Quest are, you know, omnipresent. So increasingly availability of testing is much less of a problem. And I'll say this is a little bit of a preview, but we're rolling out a much more concierge based uh, testing approach to really simplify, and simplify for our members, whether you want to test, whether you want the test delivered to you at home, whether you want to, um, uh, we'll, we'll give you information about the most, the nearest um, uh, reputable place to get a test. Uh, we're, we're, we're all sort of really galvanizing around simplifying this process and making testing easy and accessible. Next slide. So, um, and it brings up a really important question about why you test. So there's the diagnostic testing, the test to see if somebody's infect, infect, currently infected, which is absolutely essential, a critical, critical part of the public health strategy to address COVID, to understand who is infected, to isolate them, and to trace their contacts. That is the antigen or molecular test. It tests if the, if the, if the uh, virus is currently active and being shed by the patient. Um, the turnaround, the test capacity is increasing. The turnaround time is getting faster, but still a little bit of a challenge because it's Folks are frustrated if there's a day or two delay in, the, in getting a response, but increasingly that, that turnaround time is, is shortening. The test characteristics are great. You know, this is with respect to these types of tests, the, the antigen molecular tests, the characteristics, the, 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 ability, the, the likelihood that the test will capture a positive infected person is really, really high. The specificity, the likelihood that it'll tell you you're not infected if you're not, also really high. So those test characteristics are really good. It's important to recognize that the most important characteristic of the test, of their characteristics, is sensitivity, your ability to identify someone who's infected. So most of the, uh, so essentially all the, 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 the tests that are available at the national labs 
uh, now have a sensitivity over 99%. So they're really, really good at telling you if you're infected currently. Um, if you have the infection, they're very good at identifying that. Um, the one thing that I think increasingly we're going to need to, and we're trying to do at Humana, I think others are all trying to do, is try to make sure that there's some coordinating function here to try to help uh, our members, to help patients understand when it's appropriate, when they need to be tested, uh, and where and how to do it. That coordinating function to simplify and break it down for patients is really critical. For us, we have a, um, a, a bot on our website that is really, really easy to use. You put in your symptoms, you put in your exposures, and it'll give you really clear guidance and put in all of your symptoms. And it'll tell you, can you go to a local you know, Walmart or, or, or retail pharmacy? Uh, can we sit, should we mail you? Will we, should we just mail you a test uh, based on the symptoms you're having? Do you need testing at all? If you've got no symptoms and no high-risk exposures, chances are you don't need a test. Or do you need to see a physician? And, and will the, if for those that are having certain kinds of symptoms, that's the recommendation. But that coordinating function is increasingly valuable to try to help patients who are not really clear on what the thresholds are to get a test uh, about how to make that decision. The other, key, the other key rationale for testing that many of you all are thinking about is around reentry planning and how to decide whether or not to test patients, test your employees before they return to work. Um, for this increasingly, the, so some people are using antigen tests to try to identify, are they, um, are they uh, do, do they have, have they been infected, but they're still asymptomatic to try to identify those asymptomatic people uh, earlier so they don't spread the disease. And others are lo looking at antibody testing. For antigen testing, you need to have a pretty high suspicion that you're about, you know, either an outbreak or there's a lot of uh, disease in the, there's this very high prevalence that to, to sort of substantiate a rationale to do that. The antibody testing is more complicated. And we'll talk about that more in, in just a second. Um, but again, the, the, so with antibody testing, that there's a whole host of tests that are available on the marketplace. Um, the, um, the, the characteristics of those tests can be highly variable, although the newer tests from the commercial labs have much, have much better test characteristics. In this case, the issue is more around specificity. It's around making sure that if somebody is negative, that you identify them as negative, and that you don't come, come up with lots of false positives. High rates of false positives in reentry planning is incredibly disorienting and creates a great deal of stress and complexity that um, really sort of uh, is, an, is a barrier to safe and uh, smooth reentry to the workplace. And because of the low levels of prevalence of COVID on a population level, um, and because of the levels of the, the, the test characteristics, essentially mo in most settings where the prevalence continues to be low, we're seeing re very high rates of false positives uh, of the antibody tests. Generally speaking, there's as many false positives as there are true positives. And that makes it really, really hard to interpret. As an example, a test that's 99% specific, it sounds like really good specificity, means that one out of every 100 people will be a false positive in a setting where the prevalence is low, maybe 1%, which is pretty typical in mo or across the country today, you would identify one true positive in 100 patients or 100 employees and one false positive. So the, the high, the, with antibody testing, even in that setting with a very high specificity, because the prevalence is low, the rate of false positives uh, is, is, makes it really, really hard to interpret. Okay, next slide. So, you know, conceptually, there's a lot of appeal uh, for the use for antibody testing. I think everybody recognizes that there is an intuition here that says, hey, I'd love to know who's at risk. I'd love to be able to make decisions about personal protective equipment. I'd love to reduce the need for subsequent testing. Um, and if um, I would love to make sure that patients who are having symptoms don't need to stay home or don't need to isolate, I'd love to have this sort of concept, this is concept of an immunity passport uh, that, that sort of liberates uh, a return to work. 
that conceptually and intuitively um, sounds really uh, appealing. But if you go to the next slide, the, the key challenges today are the, is around the evidence. There's a lot we do not know today about, about antibody testing. We don't know the extent to which the presence of antibodies protects someone from reinfection. Are there certain levels or titers of antibodies that you need to hit in order to be protected? If somebody who is asymptomatic and never really had a, a strong antibody, let's say they never really had a strong antibody um, uh, 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 reaction, maybe they're not protected. And the extent to which that, that there's a, a level or a, a, a dose of antibody that's needed, we don't know. We don't know if patients with antibodies still can uh, shed the virus. And there's some evidence that they do. Maybe the biggest challenge is duration. There are recent studies that highlight the fact that the, the patients may not have long durations, or maybe on the order of just a couple months, that patients who have been infected and have antibodies have continued protection. In that setting, with those questions unanswered, it's really, really hard to understand how to interpret a positive test and what that means for that employee in terms of their safety for return to work. It's also really important to recognize that herd immunity, which is a concept you hear a lot on the news, is not something that happens until you get to really high levels of, of, uh, of the population that have been infected and have presence of antibodies. And we're not anywhere close to that today. We need to get somewhere to 60 to 70% to create a meaningful herd immunity. And we're, we're not even close. Um, and ultimately, uh, these questions about false positives, how to interpret the, the, what, it, what that test means in terms of conferring protection subsequently, um, the duration of that protection, if there is any of that's really, if, if the protection is meaningful, these are really important questions that we don't have answers to. There are two large scale studies, one being done by the CDC, one being done by the NIH, that should give us much more definitive answers on these. And in the next month, they should be published and shared with us. So I think there is a lot more to come, but at this point, as a result of these key questions, the CDC, is suggesting that we don't use antibody tests. CMS is saying to insurance companies, don't pay for these tests because that's a tacit approval of the use of these tests at a time where, um, where we don't really know how to interpret their results. So at this point, there, you know, the sort of the key federal agencies are not recommending the use of antibody tests as a return to work strategy because of the diff difficulties in really interpreting what those results mean. Next slide, please. So what we did, nonetheless, is uh, we at Humana pulled together, or I pulled together the chief medical officers of a bunch of other health plans, of the two largest lab companies, of a bunch of health systems, to try to come up with a strategy around, let's say these antibody tests do ultimately prove to demonstrate some meaningful protection. Let's make a really simple algorithm that once they do, we'll be able to all agree. This is how we're going to use them. Because I think as, as soon as there's more data that becomes available, it's, we don't, like, it's, it's really hard for us all to interpret this data because there's so many different variables. The prevalence, the quality of the test, uh, the risk of the employee, depending on you know, the type of work they do. So we came up with a simple algorithm that brings all of those characteristics, all of those uncertainties into the same process to make a simple decision, uh, almost essentially a numerical decision about whether or not to use antibody testing for reentry. So once again, we don't, we don't, we're not recommending this now. We need more data on the utility of the antibody test, but this is for the future. We're, we're trying to get this published and wanna start uh, sharing this so that as we get more information, the answer is not yes or no, let's go, that, that we, we we, you have some, some tools to think about your employees and how to make decisions for your employees. And it requires you to sort of walk through this very simple algorithm that says, what are the test characteristics? Does it have very high specificity and only demanding a very high specificity um, uh, uh, in order to, to sort of employ the test? Um, some, some questions about the risk of your employee population. 
are you in a healthcare company where your, your employees are actually dealing with sick patients? That's the highest risk. If you have frequent close uh, uh, exposures with non-employees, customers, retail settings, like somebody's a, a clerk at a grocery store, that's high risk, but less risk than a healthcare setting. If you work in a meatpacking uh, environment where you're in really close quarters and there's no way to avoid that and there's no way to create that social distancing, that's higher risk as well. And those are the three categories of work that we think are sort of most important to think about from a return to work testing uh, perspective. And then underlying prevalence of disease in the, in the region in which the, the employees work. And then just follow the simple algorithm to make, to come up with a numerical outcome that'll help you decide whether or not it makes sense to use the antibodies, antibody testing across the population or not to understand risk and to um, you know, better strategize about how to keep people safe. So I just wanna reiterate two things. One is this is a, this is, you would never use this, to, you would never use an algorithm like this to say yes or no, we're, this is, these people should or should not return to work. It's about how they return to work and how they return to work most safely so that we can keep everybody as safe as possible. The other thing is we are not recommending today antibody testing for return to work for, because it's very hard to interpret the, what a positive result means and whether it's useful. But we do wanna start this discussion with you in case that becomes positive that in, in case we become you know, convinced that antibody tests confer some meaningful protection and useful results, that not everyone just goes out and gets it. But we have a really thoughtful way of saying whether or not your employees sort of fit the right criteria in the right market and with the right test to warrant the use uh, of antibody testing. Next slide, please. So, uh, and the last question is around antigen testing for return to work. Uh, I think we're all kind of trying to figure this, whether or not, you know, it, we should be checking people regularly. Uh, we still don't know what the right frequency is, but if you have a lot of disease and you're a lot of virus in your region, there's a lot of people who are, yeah, and you really want to identify asymptomatic people before they, re before they get back into the workplace. There's more, uh, today, the 3% of employees in the U.S. are, are employing the strategy. Um, and um, we're thinking harder about, you know, whether or not to use antigen tests to see if people are actively infected but not yet symptomatic as a way to try to reduce uh, uh, bringing virus back into the workplace at the point of reentry. Today, there's still very little consensus around the use of, of these tests. Next slide, please. So um, I think uh, rather than, than, than spend more time on this, let's, I think it's a good time to open it up to questions and more of a discussion. Uh, I know this is really complicated. The testing part is really complicated uh, and we're here. So come ask us questions. We'd love to help guide you and give you direction around how to make these decisions. We see our role as a partner to our, our, you know, our, the, 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 the companies we work with. And we're really interested and deeply committed to trying to help you make the right decisions uh, and do all the right things to make sure that your employees are most, most safe uh, and most productive uh, and have the best experience as they're trying to deal with all the uncertainty around the pandemic. Thanks. You might want to just maybe just move to the next slide. Good morning, and Dr. Schrank, thank you so much. That was amazing information. Um, you really helped demystify testing, which uh, for many of us um, is really a challenge right now. There's, there's so much that's being said, so much that we hear. Um, on the news, from friends, from family, but you really demystified a very difficult topic, made it very plain, easy to understand, and helping navigate returning to work, which is a difficult topic as well. A few takeaways that I heard, um, very loud and clear, if you're sick, please stay home. Um, and we will definitely stay tuned for Humana's uh, testing, home testing, that's great to know, I just took a COVID test last week, and yes, that uh, 
nasal swab. Um, it's quick though, it's brief, it's a little uncomfortable, but it's terrific to know that Humana is on the front end of innovation and in getting testing at home. Um, and please, if, if you're hearing this um, live or in a recording, please go to the Humana website and look at the bot to help determine uh, t the testing needs based on the information that you put in. So again, thank you, Dr. Schrank. Let's, let's jump right into q and I love that you're, you're ready to take on some questions. Um, one question that may be top of mind for many, including myself, um, how will we know which tests are reputable and trusted? I hear a lot of people are getting tested, but not sure how to know if the test they took is accurate or not. And should they trust the ones provided in their area and take one? Yeah, so um, the good news is that uh, the large, um, first of all, testing is getting better. Uh, and you know, increasingly the, the, the standards around tests uh, are clearer. Uh, if you go to any large national lab, you're going to get a very, a test with very good test characteristics. If you go to, if you go to your healthcare provider, you're going to get a test with a really good test characteristics. The risk is there, you know, there's a hand, I think there, there may be, um, uh, sort of, so we as a company, Humana, we have relationships with a large variety of lab companies um, and that we contract with, all of whom we validate the kinds of tests that they use to make sure that we approve of them, that they have good enough test characteristics that we recommend them. The risk is if you go to a, a you know, sometimes a, a lab that's not in our network, um, that we don't have a relationship with and that doesn't require a doctor's order, you can just go and get a lab and um, it'll be free. I mean, we'll ultimately, if it's, a, if it's a molecular test, we'll pay for it. Um, but it'll be a lot harder to interpret. It may be harder to interpret because we haven't been able to sort of validate the test. And I don't think it's easy for a patient to try to figure, have a list of, there's a lot of tests that are available today. I think it's really hard for a patient to serve as that sort of arbiter. I would love to see just that, you know, we don't want anyone not to get a test. We want people who need, who need testing to be tested. We would just love to see um, our members use uh, our network lab providers that we've already gone through and sort of been pretty thoughtful about validating that the, the test characteristics are good. Terrific. Thank you for that answer. Um, here's another question for you. I've seen in the news that antibody tests aren't always reliable, even as much as 50% false positive. What is your reaction to that? And does it change your perspective on testing? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that is um, that the, the, the question about the interpretability of antibody tests uh, it's really complicated and it's really hard to know what to make of them. And I think we all think, you know, we think of antibodies in terms of um, uh, our vaccinations and if antibodies are present, then we know we're protected for a certain amount of time. Uh, but we don't have that clear evidence here with COVID. So we don't know the utility of a positive antibody anyway. Yeah. And you, when you put that together with the fact that Prevalence of the disease is low, and the test characteristics still aren't, you know, aren't perfect. And high rates of false positives, it makes those antibody tests really, really hard to interpret. So I think that question sort of gets right at the core of the issue around antibody testing today. Uh, around, um, you know, where I think it's just not we're we're not ready for prime time in terms of uh, 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 it recommending them for the use of return to work policies. Dr. Frank, do you have any guidance on hybrid reopening plans to accommodate various employees' needs, such as comfort level based on individual needs, kids without childcare or those at higher risk? And do you bake options in or deal with them on the one-off? Oh, you know, that's a really good question. I think one of the things that's hard, um, 
that's hard for uh, employers, how personally disruptive this pandemic is. You know, many of us, whether you're caring, whether you're a caregiver for a parent or for a child, whether you have high, whether you have meaningful health risks, whether you're perfectly healthy, but you care for somebody or have exposure to somebody who has meaningful health risks. We're all, we're all sort of, you know, dealing with this and dealing with a very different, you know, widely different sense of risk tolerance, risk aversion, um, and, you know, what, what, how much, how much exposure we're willing to tolerate in that setting, and particularly in a setting where a meaningful number of our employees have heart disease, have lung disease, have diseases that put them individually at meaningful risk of getting the disease, of, of, of having bad consequences from contracting COVID. You, you really need to have a prospective um, position that gives our, your, gives our employees choice. It gives our employees um, that shows that we're sensitive to, and we will always um, prioritize the health of our employees. In that setting, you know, making some decisions about saying, well, you know, you have choices. Your choices are if you if the work you're doing absolutely has to happen, you know, in a specific setting, we're going to figure out ways to work around it. We're going to, you know, we're going to give you choices to make sure you're safe. I think that those are the conversations to have proactively rather than reactively reacting to each individual employee. Because um, I think there are a lot of employees that probably feel uncomfortable about posing these questions don't want to risk losing their job. And the idea of just being really, really sort of uh, both empathic, empathic, proactive, that's the kind of, you know, culture and environment we're all trying to produce um, uh, with, with, the, with our employees. Thank you, great, great answer and you're right. It is absolutely complex. Um, COVID does not have a textbook, so here we are. A um, Couple more questions that are coming in. Um, David is asking, I understand the testing aspect of the what was that, that was discussed, but what is more important? Should we be returning to work or opening our offices? If we do the nasal test, is that a predictor for being, for bringing staff back to the office because they can be negative one day and positive the next? So, uh, David, it's a really good question, and that's one of the, the it's the uncertainty here that makes things so hard. We don't have, you know, I wish, I feel like for my entire career, the whole process has been to evaluate large tomes of evidence and say, all right, well, this is what the evidence shows. Here, a lot of this is evolving. We're figuring it out sort of, you know, we're learning more about how the disease is, is, is contracted, how, you know, we're learning more about this disease sort of as it, uh, as, as, as the days pass. I, the challenge you've got, and I, I, you know, I think to the extent that people can work safely from home, many of us are reassured to see that. And I know we at Humana are still giving people a lot of flexibility to continue to work from home. The, um, for those that really need to return to work, the antigen test is useful really at that one point in time. And then the risk is that that person is negative on day one, but then in, in two and a half weeks, goes out to dinner, contracts the illness, is asymptomatic for two days, comes to work for two days, and infects a couple other people uh, before developing symptoms and then, go, and then being diagnosed and staying home. So how do you, you know, really mitigate that risk. It's not that easy to do. I would say that a couple things are around sort of that culture of making sure, encouraging all of your employees to be safe when they're not at work. And then second, while they're at work, to make sure that there um, are appropriate social distancing, appropriate disinfection, appropriate use of masks in common spaces, to try to really reduce the likelihood that there's any spread at work if somebody were infected. Um, and I think you, that culture of being able to really identify as soon as somebody has a fever or feels sick, that they don't come to work to reduce the likelihood that it'll spread. 
but there's, there's almost, I mean, there's really no way to eliminate all risk. You have to test somebody every single day. That would not only be prohibitively expensive, it would be really annoying and you would have a mutiny on your hands if you tried to do that. Um, you know, there's some companies that are thinking about, is there a, a better cadence? Can we do it every week or every month? This is where there's no good evidence, right? It's not like there's a best practice here. Um, and frankly, I haven't seen, you know, anybody that's happy that they're doing it more than once. I think the only, there are some companies that have done it once at the point of reentry, just sort of clear the slate. Um, but there, you know, there just isn't a great uh, uh, roadmap on this. The best thing you can do if patients need to get back to the office is to make sure that workplace is as safe as possible and to make sure that your employees have such a profound understanding, a clar clarity around, um, around how to keep themselves safe both in the office and when they're at home that it really reduces the likelihood they contract and then ultimately spread the condition uh, amongst your other employees. Perfect. One final question. We're close to time, but we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, one quick one here. What should I do if an employee tests positive while at work? Well, so that is, first of all, it's better to know than not to know, right? So the, the moment you know, you got to, that person has to be isolated and sent home. The, there's a handful of things. The CDC offers some guidelines on what to do. Um, there, so first, you have, it's the, the local public health organization needs to be notified, and they will do a complete contact tracing. But you need to, you know, be really, really, um, uh, 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 you know, very specific about a, a, a disinfection mitigation process. You have to really clean that workplace probably the whole floor to make sure that that you know that 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 that, it, that your the rest of the employees are safe to continue to work in that in that environment um, you also need to make sure really try to identify all the employees that work close to or have been potentially exposed to that uh, that employee that was infected with the goal of encouraging them to stay home encouraging them to isolate uh, encouraging them to get tested try to make sure that um, you, you know, as rapidly as possible, contain uh, any spread that's happened so that you don't further that spread. Identifying having a positive diagnosis uh, is an opportunity to really, you know, uh, reduce to contain the spread. And you have to act quickly and thoroughly and thoughtfully. So it's a, there's, there are features around, um, around cleaning there are features around isolating the sick pe person, but it's also really understanding the contacts at work and trying to make sure that uh, they're isolated and they're, they're kept safe as well. Dr. Frank, we are close to time. Uh, thank you so much for a tremendous conversation and demystifying what, what is a very challenging um, subject that most of us are trying to figure out, but with your leadership and information today, I think we're all much smarter. Um, we will post the information on the Chamber's website. Additionally, we will make sure that uh, the resources that Humana has are posted as well. So thank you so very much for taking time out this morning to talk to our members. It is ab pleasure. absolutely my pleasure. And please let us know if you got more questions, uh, you know where to come. Terrific, we had some come in. We'll try and get those out to you. I'd also like to give a quick thank you to my colleagues behind the scenes, Spencer Mapes and Tracy Broccoli, who are the experts who made today's session possible. And we do have additional webinars that are coming up. So please make sure um, that you check out our Diversity, Equity, Leadership Now series that's coming. And if you're interested in maximizing your chamber membership or enrolling in chamber health through the Humana program, or just learning more about um, how to maximize your information around COVID through your membership, please reach out to our team at 513-579-3111 or go to cincinnatichamber.com slash membership. Thank you to all of our members, sponsors, and attendees today. Stay safe, stay connected, and stay encouraged.